talking backstage a little bit and saying if it bleeds, it leads. James was detained by the Chinese government, and that's what brought him to the front page of the New York Times and so on. So I think we need at least a cursory recitation of what happened to you at the 2008 Olympics. Okay. Okay. Okay, can we go back to the computer real quick? Just for a second. Okay. Okay, just to go back to, okay, this story begins in China, but in a different China. It began in Hong Kong. And I met a guy named MCN. And if you guys have never heard of this group, you'll buy it. His band is called Lazy Motherfucker. And they're, I mean, they're defunct at this point. They started in, like, late 90s, and they're really, like, the first dirty Chinese hip-hop band. Dirty meaning they cuss, you know? And MCN had this idea. He was like, I'd really like to tag Tiananmen Square. I don't know what I would write there, but it would be funny. You know, I want to write something funny there. And so we thought, well, we could maybe come up with something. So we did some sort of practice runs where we tried to do laser tag from, like, large distances away. And we did one in Hong Kong, from Hong Kong Island across Victoria Harbor to Kowloon Island. And, you know, it kind of worked, but it required, like, a really far away. And you needed a zoom, like, super nice camera to zoom across, and it still had all this equipment and bullshit. And what you could write, these sort of, like, scratched out, this is Hong Kong sort of in Chinese, you know, scratchily rendered. It was really, really hard. You know, like, I couldn't do, I could do nothing. I looked like a drunk going through DTs, like, on this wall from 1,200 meters away. So we thought we need to go back to the drawing board to come up with this idea. Meanwhile, Yan got into some trouble. Some people came to him and said, you're on a list. Be careful, you know. So he was like, sorry, guys, I can't be involved. So we got invited to be in, in this show called Synthetic Times in Beijing. It was like a big sort of celebration of uh, new media art sponsored by just every new media art organization in the world. MoMA, Ivy, and Parsons. These are three that I've worked at. But, you know, there are hundreds. Ars Electronica, Nobi in Korea, and so on and so forth. And um, unbeknownst to all these organizations, or maybe beknownst to them, the Chinese government was... Uh, asking the, cur- the curator to censor the artist just to make sure that they were politically neutral. So the curator approached us, said, would you like to be in the show? We said, yes, we planned to do it, we bought tickets, we set up our project. And then in the meantime, uh, he said, can you make your project politically neutral? And we said, oh, it's just we don't have that button on the technology. We don't have, like, a filter. You know, I, I hand the laser beam to someone else, you know, and I'm not going to tackle them. I'm certainly not going to censor them, you know. So he said, you're out. And I was like, oh. That sucked, right in front of our students. It was like this messy situation. So another organization invited us, uh, this group called, uh, this part of Beijing called 798, which is a big art district. And they were like, we want you guys to come and show in this gallery. But apparently someone wrote an article in Hong Kong that, you know, these guys aren't pushing it enough. And so the Chinese government said, uh-oh, someone might push it. So no new art 798 during the Olympics. So we got canceled again. In the meantime, a group came to us me and Evan, um, from an organization called Students for Free Tibet. And they said, look, we've got this idea. We want to somehow get these messages up during the Olympics. Will you make a tool for us to do so? And so I was like, this is sort of serendipitous, right? We were trying to make this device uh, for Yen, but, you know, that sort of gig disappeared. But someone else now says they'd like to use this tool. So we said yes. And we say yes to everybody, you know, as a rule. I have no particular, like... uh, uh, <clears throat> iron in the fire for Tibet, um, or maybe I do, but my own personal opinion doesn't really have to do with it. We're just a free speech organization, you know. So you come to us the free speech issue, we'll help you. If you come to us the product you want to market, you already have your outlet for that, you know. But if you don't have a voice, we're, we'll try our best to give you one. So we made this device. <clears throat> um, they bought us tickets to Beijing. I wasn't kind of completely finished with it um, when I went there. But um, we did some test runs to see if it would work. And the device looks a little bit like this. You know, you've got a laser beam. You have a piece of a rubber mallet that you can buy at the bulk of the Beijing Walmart Superstore. And you buy a knife at the Beijing Walmart Superstore, and you cut it up, and it becomes an adapter. But it adapts this laser beam to this uh, optical attachment here that's a 10 times magnifier and expander. <clears throat> and then you can stick some other stuff on the end. And then ultimately, and you can see this thing right here. There's a little stencil that I had to cut with um, my laser cutter. I am a laser cutter. Um, but um, so we 
could. We don't have a laser cutter in Beijing. So I had to go buy a printer. There was a bunch of junk I had to do while I was there. So I was, it took me a few days to get all the equipment together. Finally, I find myself in a hotel room, I mean, in my friend's apartment. <clears throat> and I'm testing for the first time this sort of um, device. And it worked, you know? We were good to go. And you can see nice, clean image. And in a package about this size, you know? So this is like a really dangerous thing to only people who are nuts. Like, for the rest of the world, this is just a silly toy. You can buy a version of this at the store that, that you know, literally puts smiley faces and hearts and things like that. But to everybody else, this is just a silly toy. So <clears throat> on the way from here, this apartment, to a bar where I was going to tell my friends we did it, tomorrow's the night, we're going to project on Tiananmen Square and the bird's nest and you'll have your, your, your message delivered. I was followed by a woman. And I remembered seeing her before. She was cute, you know, and she was always walking in front of me, so I kind of checked her out, and I was like, you know, nice ass. And then I saw her later, and I was like, nice ass, same ass? I don't know, you know, like, you, you're paranoid. <laughs> I mean, there's more than one in the world. And then, uh, then again I saw, and I was like, same nice ass. I'm fucked, you know, like, this, someone's following me, and they must have just seen that I finished this project, and I have to, like, evade this woman, you know? So I sort of pretended to fall asleep on the subway door, and then jumped out really quick. And, you know, she comes through the glass, and the train goes on. And, uh, <laughs> it's all happened just like this, you know? And, um... So I called my friends. We had some fancy phones you could make phone calls to. We were actually using Twitter to send messages to each other, you know, because when they would confiscate your phones at the end, it would just say, you know, 404 or whatever, you know, like, it would say some number that was not another cell phone address. So I told them, like, I'm screwed, like, I'm busted. I think this woman is following me, but um, I'm not sure. Maybe I evaded her. And they were like, well, look, just take a circuitous path and come meet me at this bar. So I went and I met him. I told him I think I'm in trouble. And they were like, well, let's just plan this as if you're not going to be involved. Leave here, go to your hotel, get your stuff, catch a train to Shanghai, go back to, you know, Seoul, go on to Tokyo, complete your tour. <clears throat> but um, as we left the bar, there were like 50 police officers and like 10 camera crews. And, wow. you know, they were making a big show of arresting us. So, yeah, I got busted. I got arrested. We got interrogated. You know, I lied through my teeth because I thought that's what you're supposed to do. And um, <clears throat> then, unlike the 42 other people who had come into China and done Tibet-related projects, something about maybe the level of technology we had or maybe our attitudes or maybe they just didn't like me, um, they decided to keep us for a while. So they sent us to this place called Changwen Prison. And we were in Changwen for... We got, we got 10 day sentences in Changwen, along with a lot of other Chinese nationals who were also protesting. And Mongolian men who, you know, passports had expired. And, um, some like a Nigerian PhD ec economics professor who really wasn't sure why I was there, you know. It's administrative detention, so they don't have to give you a charge or a reason. They can just give you a sentence. So we were sentenced without a charge. Our charge informally was upsetting the public order, but I'd actually not done anything except project free beer on a building, which 